Oh, guck hey, mal hier. Yo, ich oh, ja. Es gibt eine Setup-Tour von 2023. Das können wir gleich mal, das können wir gleich mal hinterher schieben. <lacht> das gucken wir jetzt auch gleich nochmal an, Chat. Okay, das, das interessiert mich, weil hier sind ja auch äh, sehr große Monitore verbaut. Und das würde mich mal interessieren, wie das aussieht mit riesigen Monitoren. We're all here, so it's been a couple of months now since we moved into our new studio space that we shared with you. And we've had a bit of time to settle in and optimize a few things. So I wanted to spend some time today. Es ist so schön, dass er von YouTube oder was auch immer er noch extra macht, das machen kann. Das ist so toll. Taking you on a bit of an updated tour of the whole setup, basically, and a lot of little technical details that we didn't really. Und er hat auch eine Test Station. Cover in the previous studio tour. There's a lot of little tips and tricks that we've come across over the last couple of years since we set up this rig initially. We're going to take you through all that stuff today, so that you get a better idea of exactly how we do things here at Booster Media. So let's start off with das Ding ist, wenn ich größere Monitore haben wollen würde, bräuchte ich auch schon wieder einen größeren Monitor-Stand, ne? Oh, Mann, ey, das ist jedes Mal so ein Käse. What I'm sure you guys are most interested in, the 665-inch 4K SIM rig. Now, we originally built this rig Uh, was it more than two years ago now? It was back in October, November, December of uh, 2021. And it's been through a number of revisions since then just to sort of optimize things and get things running as best as they can possibly be with the technology at least that we have available. So you'll remember back when we originally built it, it was running off a system that was basically just a, uh, a rig. Das ist, <lacht> das ist so geil. On a test bench like this. Uh, this is actually the new, uh, the new test system that we're running at the moment. I'm just doing some optimization with uh, overclocking and things like that. So we've got the old 3090 that we schön. were previously running on the sim rig plugged into that at the moment. And we will be transplanting this motherboard and CPU. This is a uh, ASUS ROG Maximus uh, Z790 motherboard. Uh, we're running the 690 at the moment with the 12900K in the actual rig, but yeah, we'll be putting the 13900 with the Z790 in that in the rig uh, as soon as I get the opportunity to do so and as soon as I've finished all the optimization. But uh, in terms of the build itself, you guys have seen this before, so we won't spend a whole bunch of time here. This is essentially a uh, workshop trolley from a uh, car shop here in Australia, Super Cheap Auto. Uh, and I basically, over the course of a number of months, built the entire rig into this. So the top layer is what runs the sim rig. We've got the 12900K, as I said, uh, 64 so gram in there and then the 4090. Now I haven't water cooled the 4090 to date simply because the uh, the massive coolers that they put on these GPUs from stock are actually overrated for the actual thermal dissipation that's required. So this only gets up to around sort of 65, 70 degrees uh, most of the time, which isn't you know a whole lot hotter than what we would be getting with water cooling anyway. So I have, just haven't really felt the need. Uh, you might notice in there, we are still running the original Nvidia Uh, adapter cable that uh, quite a few people had problems with on the internet. I have actually got a replacement cable to swap that out with when we uh, when we put the new motherboard in there as well that I got from Cable Mod. Uh, but yeah, haven't had any problems with that to date. It's all good. So I should explain that the top level here is what's running the sim rig specifically. So if we come around here, we've got the three uh, 65 inch 4K displays. Uh, we've got obviously the wheelbase, the pedals, the steering wheel, the motion platform that we'll take you through all the details on in just a minute. All of that stuff is all being run by the top level. And then the bottom level is what's actually responsible for capturing video and capturing audio. So if we come back around here again, uh, we've got the Go XLR, which is like a little audio routing tool and mixing desk. <laughs> das ist halt einfach für mich so, why? Macht man das jetzt? Aber okay, es erfüllt auch seinen Zweck. That's, uh, so that's plugged into the SIM PC. So that captures the, or takes the audio out of the game, takes the microphone input. You can actually see that going there at the moment. We've got a couple of different inputs there that we can use for various different channels and that allows us to separate the audio. And then we uh, go up to the fourth screen here, which is actually connected to the second PC. And you can see I've got an old version of OBS running there because I use... Oh, Streamlabs OBS. Also, was? Use uh, NDI to actually get... Uh, got an old version of OBS running there because I use uh, NDI to actually get uh, video from the SIM PC across. To 
Wenn es funktioniert, wenn es funktioniert, gut. To the other PC through the network. We'll talk about networking in just a minute too. Uh, so that is the display for the uh, for the capture PC. And then basically, what that does, the reason we do it that way is because it offloads a lot of the uh, a lot of the unnecessary processing onto a different machine. So we're not putting a parasitic load on the SIM PC. Obviously, we want to have as many frames as we possibly can on that, and removing as much processing from that as possible is the best way that we've found to do that. So that is the reason why we've got this crazy sort of dual system going on here. The bottom system is a uh, 8700K, and actually no, it's an 8086K processor. Uh, so it's a number of years old now. It's a Z390 ASUS ROG motherboard and there's a 2080 Ti running in there. Now, the system is completely overkill for what it's actually being used for. Sei nicht traurig. Er meint das nicht so. Er streamt nicht. Nein, na, er, ja, ich war, er streamt nicht. Er bra ja, ja, ja. Entspann dich. Alles gut. Nein, du bist nicht overkill. Nein. Mm -mm. Alles gut. But that was the uh, the hardware that I happened to have available uh, at the time that we built it, so that's what I used in there. But I don't think that's going to need to be upgraded for a very long time. So let's go back around to the SIM rig now. I'll run you through the hardware that we're actually running on. This is another question we get asked a lot: is you know what hardware are we actually running on the SIM rig here? So starting off with the massive 65-inch displays here. The first thing you need to understand is that these aren't TVs. A lot of people say, what TVs are you running? Uh, they're actually big format gaming displays. So they're HP Omen Imperium X gaming displays. They're 144 hertz uh, with G-Sync as well. So that's actually quite useful. You can imagine, even with the high-end system that we're running there, running this kind of resolution, we're running 11, 520 by 2160 pixels. So triple 4K resolution. So you can imagine it's quite hard to Und deswegen benutzt er übrigens NDI wahrscheinlich, weil er das nicht in der Capture Card reinkriegt. Run that at 144 frames per second. Ja, da ist das Ding. Und deswegen NDI. So G-Sync actually does work very well. Now another big advantage that we found with these particular screens is that they have display ports too, because most modern graphics cards, unfortunately these days, uh, and we might see in the next generation, it might switch back to HDMI 2.1 or something like that. But at the moment, the graphics cards still have uh, still have display ports on them and usually only one on Ich würde nicht sagen, was kann man mit Geld anstellen, Rezo, und das hat er, also wirklich jetzt, und das muss man neidlos anerkennen, das hat er sich alles hart erarbeitet. Also, wenn man sich das anguckt, was er die letzten Jahre alles getestet hat und wo er herkommt, hat er sich das wirklich hart erarbeitet, was da steht. Also nicht mal, ob das jetzt gekauft ist. Ähm, natürlich ist das bei YouTubern oder Content Creators oft noch ein Sponsoring dazu. Ne? Or maybe two HDMI ports. So being able to run the uh, being able to run Display Port cables directly across from the displays to the PC has been really advantageous. Uh, there's a lot of issues with running adaptive sync if you're using adapters. Uh, a lot of people I've seen have run into issues like that. So I have been keeping a close eye on display technology, particularly in the last six months. We've seen a lot of larger gaming displays coming out. Uh, we actually have one and I'll show you in a minute that we're going to be testing very soon. Uh, but yeah, I just haven't really found anything that, um, that I think would be a direct replacement for these yet. So that's the reason we're still running these. Unfortunately, they are discontinued. Uh, they haven't been available for quite some time now, so you can't really buy them anymore. But yeah, at the moment at least, they still appear to be the best thing to suit our very specific needs. And we've talked before about the fact that I would never recommend that anybody build a system like this. Uh, unless it was for content creation, obviously. Good. Obviously our needs here are very specific. And, you know, essentially this is a business tool. We use it to produce all of our uh, hyper-realistic sim racing videos that you guys see on the channel. So in terms of other hardware that we're running here, we've got a Simlabs P1X uh, cockpit, same cockpit that I've been running for a number of years now. We've put a lot of extra appendages and things on it over time, but it's stood up uh, very well. It's never had any issues with creaking. And look, to be honest with you guys, I've never even had... to go around it and tighten anything up. It's just really stood the test of time very, very well. Uh, down the bottom there, while Tom's down there with the camera too, you'll see the D-Box G3 system. Now you might be wondering why we're still running the G3 when we have the G5. We reviewed that a number of months ago now. Uh, look, this just suits our needs a little bit better than the G5 does. The um, the, the feedback that you get through it is exactly the same between the two systems, but this has just got a slightly smaller footprint. Uh, it does have the two big control boxes, but they integrate quite nicely underneath this little plate that's sitting on the uh, sitting on the base there. So yeah, we just didn't really see the need to change over from the G uh, from the G three 
to the G5. While we're down there as well, you can see the uh, same old wind simulation system that we were running before. We have a DIY video that I put together a number of years ago on that. Uh, not a huge amount of airflow that comes out of it, but it's enough to sort of give you the sensation of air movement. And uh, we talked in that video about, you know, what the advantages of that are. One question that we get a lot is, why would you want to have wind simulation if you're driving a closed cabin car? And it's more just sort of about tricking your brain. It gives, you, it gives your brain the sensation of movement, um, even though it doesn't necessarily feel all that realistic, for example. So um, yeah, it actually works really well. And I was really, that's one of my favorite things on the rig. Uh, we're still running the Acetec Invicta pedals, been really happy with them. Ich würde meine Invictas auch nur tauschen gegen Simocube-Pedale. Haven't really felt the need to change them. They suit my driving style extremely well. Uh, we have reviewed a number of really... Oh, Alter, die haben aber auch echt ein paar Runden runter. Nice pedals recently, particularly the VRS pedals. I was really impressed with them. Uh, Husingville Ultimate Plus pedals have been really good too. We ran them for a while on the rig. But yeah, just been really happy with the Acetec Invictus. So we're still running those. Uh, at the moment, we've got the, uh, the grid by SimLab uh, Porsche 911 RSR wheel installed on here, but that's something that we swap out depending on what we're driving. If you have a look over here, we've got another one of these workshop trolleys that's got say, uh, not all of the rims that we have here, but uh, the ones that I use most frequently on the rig. So we've got some, I've been using the GSI and the CSX. Also nur, jetzt mal wirklich ohne shit, nur die quick releases dazu, nur diese sind unfassbar teuer. <lacht> nur der quick release hinten dran ist schon. X3 quite a bit recently when I'm doing uh, when I'm doing GT3 stuff I often use the Cube Controls F Pro but uh, yeah it just depends on what I'm driving I don't really Das ist so schön also mich erfüllt das mich alleine erfüllt das mit Freude dass er das in der Garage stehen haben kann mich erfüllt das wirklich mit absoluter Freude das zu sehen dass jemand sagen kann cool ich gehe jetzt an mein Trolley und ich hole mir eins von zwölf Lenkrädern raus finde ich so schön das erfüllt mich innerlich mit absoluter Freude. We have a favorite wheel at the moment. It's purely just down to what's suiting uh, what I'm driving the best. So back over to the rig again. We're still running the Lusso Motors uh, bucket seat that we had uh, custom made a number of years ago now uh, with our boosted media logo on the back here. It's not the most comfortable looking thing in the world, but I actually find it very, very comfortable. Uh Witzigerweise, das gibt es bei Next Level Racing, glaube ich. Die haben auch so ein Bucket Seat. Der sieht unglaublich kacke aus. Wirklich jetzt? Der sieht richtig kacke aus. Und du denkst dir so, äh, what the fuck, da setze ich mich doch nicht rein. Und wir haben das Ding das erste Mal gehabt auf der Sim Racing Expo. Absolut geiles Teil. So unglaublich bequem, das kannst du dir gar nicht vorstellen. Auch auf Dauer, du sitzt da drinnen wie, als wenn das Ding einfach für deinen scheiß Arsch gemacht ist. Total geil, der Apparat. Würde ich mittlerweile ehrlich gesagt auch fühlen und mein Momo dafür austauschen. Fühle ich absolut den Apparat. As I mentioned in a recent video, I've actually put on quite a bit of weight since we originally bought this. Uh, I'm doing my best to lose it again at the moment, but it has it has been very very comfortable even with my increased body weight. So uh, yeah, no complaints about the seat whatsoever, and it is very light as well, which does make a bit of a difference when it comes to motion and things like that. Obviously, the less weight that you have in the rig, the more responsive. It's going to be overall and the less load you're putting on those actuators. So that's been really good too. Fährt er immer noch seine Simo Cube? Ja. And it lets us sit nice and low in the ja. rig too. One of the things that uh, we uh, talked about in some previous videos is the fact that the seating position in terms of height is very, very sensitive with this particular setup. If you're not in exactly the right spot, everything starts to bend on the screens. So yeah, having this nice and low works really, really well. Uh, then we've got the SimiCube 2 Ultimate sitting on here still. Now a lot of people might be wondering why we're we still running this. Äh, ich habe vorhin mit jemandem telefoniert und er hat mich gefragt, also wir sind irgendwie so ein bisschen auf dem Gespräch, äh, in einem Gespräch gelandet und da war die Frage, warum Menschen immer noch SimoCube fahren. Und schlichtweg, also nee, die Frage war, kommt SimoCube irgendwann nochmal mit einer neuen Wheelbase um die Ecke, weil sie ja jetzt Pedale rausgebracht haben, ne? Und dann musste ich ihm, also dann musste ich ihm wirklich sagen, SimoCube braucht nichts Neues rausbringen. Ich glaube, wenn ich mich recht entsinne, müsste diese Gerätschaft seit vier Jahren draußen sein. Die brauchen keine neue Wheelbase rausbringen. Maga, das Ding ist einfach, das hier, also die, die SimoCube Wheelbase ist einfach der scheiß fucking Lader, so. Den fährst du eine Million Kilometer, dann geht der Kilometerstand wieder runter auf 1 und dann geht's weiter. Und ich habe keine Ahnung, wie sie das hingekriegt haben oder wie sie das gemacht haben, aber sie haben es hingekriegt, ein Produkt zu bauen, was wirklich durchweg 
jahrelang funktioniert, weil es keine Updates braucht. Also Software wird noch geupdatet, da arbeiten sie ja immer regelmäßig dran. Aber selbst da, ich habe seit, äh, schöne Grüße gehen raus an Stun, seitdem ich meine Wheelbase habe, habe ich nichts an dieser Wheelbase umgestellt. Sie hat noch nicht niemals funktioniert und ist das konstanteste Teil an dem Rig, was ich besitze. Das ist absolut über drei Jahre pure Konstanz. Die habe ich mir für 1400 Euro gekauft. Das Produkt war an gar keiner Stelle noch nicht ein einziges Mal enttäuschend. Und das ist mit einer der ältesten Direct Drive Wheelbases, die es gibt. Der Quick Release ist immer noch nicht outdated. Das Einzige, was man sagen könnte, okay, man muss einen Pin reindrücken, äh, damit er hält. Ist ein bisschen scheiße, okay, kann ich nachvollziehen. Das könnte man eventuell neuer machen. Ansonsten ist an dem Ding nichts zu mäkeln. Gar nichts. Ist für mich persönlich immer noch der absolute Platzhirsch, was in diesem Preissegment vorhanden ist. Und jetzt kommt das kleine bis mittelschwere, aber Asitec hat sehr, 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 sehr gute Wheelbases. Sie haben nur leider den Quick Release noch nicht dafür. Und da ist nachher die Frage, ob der Quick Release an dieser Stelle das so simpel macht, wie beispielsweise eine Simo Cube das hinkriegt. Weil du kannst, wenn du eine Simo Cube kaufst, du so einen Adapter, schraubst den an den Lenkrad, hängst den da rein, drückst den Pin rein, fertig ist. Das ist die Frage. Weil wäre das, äh, wäre das hier möglich, dass man das einhängen könnte und es hätte Kontakt und würde so funktionieren, das wäre noch so ein Punkt, wo es besser wäre. Aber da ist halt wieder die Frage, wie das nachher mit der Konnektivität der Lenkräder aussieht. Weil mich persönlich jetzt stören diese Kabel nicht. Es gibt super viele Menschen, die stört das. Ne? Mich stört das nicht, weil es hier, bei mir hängt mein Kabel hier an der Seite dran und äh, macht jetzt für mich keinen Unterschied, ob das da bammelt oder nicht. Ne? Das wäre noch eine Weiterentwicklung, die man machen könnte. Aber ey, warum solltest du das ändern? So? Warum sollen die jetzt was Neues rausbringen? Ehrlich, warum sollten die eine neue Wheelbase machen? Oder rausbringen? Bin ich auch, Timmy. Ich mag, das, ich mag sogar das Kabel da dran. Ich finde das auch geil, dass da unten so dieser Bommel rumfliegt und manchmal, wenn du so wirklich hoch lenkst, hast du noch so ein bisschen Kabel dran. Ich finde das auch geil. Mich stört das auch überhaupt gar nicht. Ich habe früher auch mal gedacht, dass mich das irgendwann nervt, aber nö. Uh, has slightly better force feedback, simply just because it's more practical to have on here at the moment. You can see I've got it mounted from the bottom, which means that it kind of disappears in the videos. You don't really see it behind the wheel at all. Uh, the Acetec one stands out a lot more on the rig, so we'd need to sort of mask it off a little bit more. And also just in terms of practicality, we've got the uh, zero play quick release that we run on the SimCube 2 Ultimate, and I've got the wheel side adapters for every single wheel that we use regularly at least. Uh, if I was to swap it over to the Acetec at the moment, I'd have to unscrew the wheel and screw it onto the other hub that we have all the time. So purely from a practicality point of view, the Simi Cube 2 Ultimate just suits my needs a little bit better for the daily driver rig at the moment. Really what's most important with the rig is that it's just, uh, you know, as turnkey as it can possibly be at any given point in time. I always want to be able to just sort of jump in and drive, record a video at the drop of a hat and it always needs to be functional. So we sort of, we don't play around with the configuration of this rig too much. Uh, you know, what I have on here works well. Just to give you another example as well, I've still got the Aalog shifter on here that uh, we put on there years ago now. Now, there are a couple of other shifters that we have uh, in our storage, which I actually prefer the feel of to this, but this is just super practical because I can unscrew the stem when I'm driving a car that doesn't have a shifter and you don't really see it in the video. But then if I want to have something that has a uh, sequential shifter, I can just pop it on again. And if I'm doing something that has an H pattern, then I go grab my uh, other shifters to put on there. But yeah, just little things like that from a practicality sense just makes sense so the point ja da sind ja auch zwei die sind da angeklebt hier zwischen siehst du den strich das sind zwei bezel kits und die sind übereinander und dann an den monitor geklebt point is that you know what we're running on the daily driver rig isn't necessarily the stuff that i like the most it's just the stuff that is the most practical for the purpose of what we're trying to achieve here so then we also have the asus bezel free kits on here which you guys have seen a couple of times previously so it's two per side You can see what I do is just sort of flip it around. And then I've got a piece of string with a little piece of plastic in the middle there that we pulled through from the back to just kind of fix it in place. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. We experimented with uh, double-sided tape on the edges, but it just kind of created a bit of a smudge there. So that system seems to work the best. And another shout out to Carl Gosling for that idea. He did that on his 55-inch uh, displays and uh, I thought it was a really good idea. And uh, yeah, we've been running it that way for a little bit over a year now and it's worked really, really well. But that is how we sort of blend the bezels together. Now I have experimented with a couple of other systems as well. Uh, some people take the lenses out of old display panels and use those, but I just find that the ASUS panels 
seem to just work a little bit better than any of those other solutions do at the moment. And then behind the rig to isolate things uh, both acoustically and visually, we have these acoustic panels, which we showed you in the last video. So we won't go into a bunch of detail on those again, but those seem to be standing up really well. And they actually do dead in the room quite a bit acoustically as well. We didn't want to have a completely dead sound in here. We wanted to sort of have that garage vibe, but between this and the other acoustic panels, it's actually working really well. So the other big thing with the sim rig that we've changed since the uh, since the last video is we just made a couple of little additions to the uh, to the ambient lighting system too. So if you're not familiar with what that is, we have a full video where we explain exactly what that does. But essentially, what it does is simulate the light coming in from outside the car so that you see the light change on my arms and the steering wheel as I'm driving in the rig as it would be in real life or as close as we can get it to real life. So we have this gradient strip from, uh, from Philips Hue. This is all Philips Hue lighting that we use throughout the entire house, in fact. But so, so that's a gradient strip that kind of adapts depending on what's on the screen. And then I found that so, although it was working quite well, it just wasn't quite vibrant enough or quite bright enough on my arms in particular. You guys might have noticed a couple of videos that we did after we first moved into the studio. The lighting just wasn't quite as good as it had been previous. Und dann fragen Menschen mich, wie viel Strom ich verbrauche. So what I did was I grabbed a couple of spare GU10 Philips Hue bulbs that I had kicking around. We just put them in these little uh, these little bases and uh, I've got those rigged up now as well. So um, So what they do is they just create a brighter spotlight on my hands. And again, they just sort of adapt to whatever is being displayed on the screen. And uh, it all just connects in wirelessly through the network, which I'll show you in just a minute. So while we're on the subject of lighting, something that is really important in a studio space like this one is to have complete control over the lighting. So it doesn't matter what time of the day you're filming, uh, you know, we can be filming something at midnight and it looks exactly the same as it does at midday. So the way we've achieved that is with Philips Hue lighting, pretty much, well, I've got it throughout the entire house, but down in the studio space, we've got uh, four, of these long five meter strips, similar to the gradient strip, but they don't have individual segments that are individually addressable. So the entire strip just changes. So we've got four of them, two on the car side, two on the studio side. Alter, and das alleine, das alleine, Chat. <laughs> Richtig günstig. Then I've got a bunch of scenes that I have set up through the hue system. So I can change it to blue. I can change it to red and white, red all over, daytime all over and whatever else you want. So we can obviously, we can go into the app and change all this depending on what we want. I can dim it or brighten it from here or just switch it off and on as well. Now this is all Google controlled as well. So I can talk to Google and tell it what I want it to do. If I'm leaving the house as well, it'll automatically detect that I've left and switch everything off. So it's a really, really powerful system. Now I have experimented with quite a few different lighting systems and I did pay full retail for the system as well. So this isn't any sort of a sponsored ad or anything like that. But one of the things I really like about the, the Hue systems in particular is that the software integration is really nice. So uh, the software is really clean and easy to use, but they also have these bridge systems. If you come through here, just quickly, you can see the little hue bridge that's sitting next to the router there. So what that does is it allows all the lights to actually connect to that hub and then it only requires one network connection back to the main network. So what that means is that you're not loading up your network with, you know, I've got, I think, 45 separate hue lights in the house in total, not including the ones above the rig because they're on a separate bridge. Uh, and you can imagine if you have all of those devices all connected to your wireless network, it can start to slow things down if you don't have a powerful router. So keeping everything separate like that just seems to make a little bit more sense for me. Now, while we're on the subject of network, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because that's something that I've been working on a lot recently in the studio. So you can see here we've got the uh, AX6000 ASUS ROG router. This is actually in, uh, in AI mesh mode at the moment. So we did a review of this on the channel recently. Now being out in rural Australia, we do have a lot of problems with slow internet. So come over to the table now and I want to show you how I've got things set up with this network. I've been putting a lot of uh, time into this. <laughs> Du weißt, wie viel Stuff kommt, wenn du die Ecke siehst, Alter. <lacht> Ey, Alfred, wie okay, ich grüße dich. Du weißt, wie viel Stuff einfach da kommt zum Review.